live. I'm trying to get my mic back on, it fell off. Nothing like starting off on the right foot. Well, hey everybody, my name is Johnny. I'm a believer I struggle with alcoholism and codependency and with me tonight. Hey Johnny, uh, my name is Jenny and I'm a believer who struggles with codependency and adult child of family dysfunction. So we have a minute or two before we're actually live. So you might hear us do that again, but we just wanted to kind of get started and uh, get, get the uh, camera running here so that we'd be ready to go. So as you jump on, uh, make sure that you say hello and you let us know where you're from. And um, yeah, we got some people on now. Very cool. All right, and of course, our dog decides our dog decides to bark right now, so that's fun. So, uh, but hey, we're so glad that you're uh, back with us. If you're new here to Celebrate Recovery, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're gonna do uh, the second lesson tonight, the Powerless lesson. But before we do, we're gonna read the eight principles. Um, and uh, I just thought again. Um, let's let's introduce ourselves again just in case people aren't okay. here when we first started so hey everybody again my name is Johnny I'm a grateful believer I struggle with alcoholism and codependency and hi my name is Jenny and I'm a believer who struggles with codependency and adult child of family dysfunction we're just so glad to be with for you to be with us tonight and to be here together and what we're gonna do is we're gonna read the eight principles and um, for those of you who are new um, this program has these eight principles that help us grow closer to Christ and closer, uh, go down the road of recovery. Now, it's really important that we say this. The principles and the steps themselves, they don't give us freedom. They don't heal us. They don't help us find sobriety or the life change that we're looking for. They're a tool that is used to help us step by step, day by day, grow closer to Christ because it's Him, it's the person of Jesus who gives us the power to change our lives, who helps us overcome our hurts, hangups, and habits, no matter what they are. And again, some of you may be coming here and you've only been a, a few times and you're going, man, I don't know why people keep telling me about this. I don't have a drug problem or an alcohol problem. Only a third of the people who attend Celebrate Recovery have one of those issues. Everybody else comes from a wide variety of hurts, hangups, and habits. And these eight principles really work for all of us, no matter what our area of recovery is. So we're gonna read the principles. This is right out of the- that they're based on? Yeah, the eight principles are based on the Beatitudes, and they are, um, which are the words of Jesus in a famous sermon called uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells us basically how to be happy. And these eight principles um, are, again, they're a tool, and they help us walk down the road to recovery. Now, we did hear everybody last week. I guess we read these a little fast last week. We might have sped through them. We were so excited that we get to do this. Yeah. So we were a little excited, we realized, and we, we went really fast. So we're going to try. We heard you, and we're going to try to slow down this so, week. So we'll slow down. <clears throat> so principle <laughs> one, realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Matthew 5.3. Matthew 5.3. <laughs> principle number two, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, Matthew 5, 4. Principle three, can, uh, consciously choose and commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Happy are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. <clears throat> Principle number four, openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. Principle five, voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, Matthew 5, 6. Principle number six, evaluate all of my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful, Matthew 5, 7, and happy are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. Principle seven, reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. And principle number eight, yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Matthew 5.10. Thanks, Jenny. Well, guys, like we said, we're, we're so glad that you're here with us tonight. If it's your, if you've only been here twice, maybe you came last week and uh, this is only your second time checking out Celebrate Recovery, we're so glad for you uh, that you're here with us tonight. We um, love that we're getting a chance to do these lessons online and um, 
I just, I'm so excited that we get to do this every week. So many of you last week in the comments said that you were brand new, that you were just checking out Celebrate Recovery. And that was just so cool for so many of us. I went back and read many of the comments uh, afterwards. Um, I can't read them while we're going, um, but I, I like to go back and read them later. And if you le left a prayer request, I wanna let you know I prayed for you this week. And it was just so cool to go back and see some of those uh, comments where many of you said you were here for the first time. But as a result, I got to tell you, I was actually a little surprised by that. I kind of thought that we were just going to get a lot of people who knew what Celebrate Recovery was, who missed going to their Celebrate Recovery in person. And as a result, they were going to log on and check us out, but they it wasn't going to be a bunch of brand new people. And so um, we just, as we get started tonight, I just want to tell you some of the key things about Celebrate Recovery. Uh, what you'll notice if you watch last week's denial lesson and tonight's powerless lesson is that all of our Celebrate Recovery lessons are built on acrostics. Basically, they spell out a word and each letter of that word stands for something else. And it, it helps us uh, in our recovery journey. Yeah, I, I think there might be a little bit of a buzz, but I've only seen one person say that, so I gotta just kinda keep going. So if you're, if you're having a hard time with the sound, I'm doing what I can, and if it, if it keeps going, I will drop this mic and try something else. Um, sorry about that. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll do what we can do there. Um, like I was saying, each one of the acrostics, they, they help us apply recovery. So why do we use acrostics? It's pretty simple. They help us remember. So, so much of uh, what we hear, we forget. Um, in fact, there have been some studies that say that when we hear something, we forget about 90% of what we hear. So there's a reason we do these lessons year after year because we don't remember them on our own. And so it helps us remember what's going on uh, or, or the lessons that we can learn in recovery. And so um, I guess what we'll do, Jenny, if you want to just unplug the microphone from the back there and uh, no, I think some people are saying there's a buzz, some people aren't, maybe it's the air conditioner, which we turned off. So hopefully that's the case and I'll just try to move on past that. Um, and so tonight the, the acrostic is powerless. And what we're going to discover are nine things that we lose when we admit that we are powerless over our addictions, our compulsive behavior, those things that are hurting us in our lives. Another way that we say that in recovery is hurts hangups and habits, that when we admit that we are powerless to change those things, we actually lose nine things and they're good for us to lose them. So let's look at our principle. Principle one says, realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. And as we just read a minute ago, Jesus said, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Now we also use what we call the Christ-centered 12 steps. And step one says, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives have become unmanageable. In the Bible in Romans 7, 18, it says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And I wonder if we just stop there for a second at Romans 7, 18, if, if we just thought about Paul and what he wrote and how all these years later, thousands of years later, I still relate to that comment that I have the desire to do what is right, but I cannot carry it out. I don't know about you, but I don't like admitting that I can't do something. I don't like admitting that I can't fix something or that, that there's a situation out of my control. I think about it a lot when my kids get sick. They're a little bit older now, but when they were little and they got sick, I just remember being so torn up because I couldn't do anything to make it better. Or even now as their teenagers, as, as a friend might say something unkind and hurtful, I, I, wish, I wish that I could go make that better, but I can't, I'm powerless to fix that situation. I'm, I'm a fixer. Now, some of you who know me are like, no, you're not, because I'm not a handyman. I, I don't do well with tools. In fact, if you give me a tool, I'll probably break something. I'm not that kind of fixer, but I like to fix situations. I like to give advice. If you came with a problem, I could probably give you advice to fix it. It might be terrible, terrible advice, but at least to me, it would be good. And, and I think so often in recovery, we come across this issue that we're powerless. And I know for many of us, myself included, that this world that we're in right now has reminded me how powerless I am. As I think about COVID-19 and the shutdowns and the reopenings and the shutdowns again, and I'm not even gonna get into all of the political part of that or the science part of that. What I'm gonna tell you is that I'm powerless over all of those things. There are things in there that I wish I could change and I can't. And I can either 
allow it to run my life for an hour, a day, a month, a year, or I can say I'm powerless over those things. And being in recovery and accepting that we're powerless to change our lives is actually a good thing because it helps us see that in so many areas of our lives and we can let it go and we can let God do things. Now, some of you are already tuned out because you're like, wait, Johnny, you're saying I'm powerless and I don't like that. I'm, I do have power to change. I do have power to do things. And I'm not saying that you have no power. I'm not saying that you don't have any strength or any control. In fact, that God has given us willpower. He's given us strength and he tells us in his word to chase after self-control. But many of us find that that is a, a hard battle because although we have some strength in our lives to overcome our hurts, hangups, and habits to really make the change that we're looking for, our strength is gonna wear out. It's like this, it's like this phone. I, I love phones, I love gadgets, I love all the tech stuff, right? I watch all the keynotes as they come out and all the things that are happening, I like tech. But the one thing that drives me absolutely crazy about cell phones and tablets and laptop computers is that they have a battery in them and eventually the battery dies. See, for a while, the battery has enough power to run the device, but sooner or later, you have to plug that device in. You have to change from the battery power to that electricity, the power that runs through our houses, that if we pay our bills, <laughs> all those things, we can get uh, so much more power by plugging it in. And what I'm saying is that you and I may have some power, a battery, but eventually for us to overcome our hurts, hangups, and habits, to find true freedom, not just to find a couple of days or weeks or a month of sobriety or change or freedom, but real long lasting freedom over all of our hurts, hangups, and habits, we have to plug into the power that is so much greater than ourselves and that's God's power. But for us to begin to do that, we have to realize we're not God and we have to realize that we don't have the power to change. Now that doesn't mean that change is impossible. In fact, it means that change is possible if we stop trying to do it on our own and we allow God to help us. We exchange our power for His power. We exchange our finite, tiny little bit of power for God's infinite, world-creating power. If you go back and you read the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, it talks about how God created the world. And God says, basically, let there be light. He begins to talk, he speaks the world into existence. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that, but I know I haven't. I've never spoken something into existence. I might be really hungry and I can say, taco, no taco, right? But God just said, world, and there was world. That's the kind of power we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of power that is available to you and me, the power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead to live forever. That power is available for you and me. So what we're talking about in recovery is exchanging our power for God's infinite power. And when we do, we lose nine things. We lose nine things that are actually, we think are good for us, but they actually keep us from growing. So let's look at those nine things. We're gonna start with the P in our acrostic. And that stands for pride. The first thing we lose when we admit that we're powerless is our pride. You can't be proud and also say, I'm powerless to change. And pride is a trap. Pride will kill us and it kills us slowly. Now, I have to be honest with you, this is an area I struggle with. And I think many of us do, but I know I do. I struggle with this. I like for people to like me. I'm a people-pleasing codependent, but I also like to feel good about accomplishments. And it's not saying that we can't feel good about those things, but what we're really talking about is this desire to put ourselves in God's place. And when we admit that we are not God, we realize I'm not God, we move ourselves out of his position, his rightful position. And when we put him in that place, we, got, we start to see ourselves not as unimportant, but is not as, not as God. See, the being, not having pride, the, the antonym for that isn't not thinking you're important. You are important. You're loved by God. God created you. He made you. He, he made you to be you. He took your parents' DNA and put them together just so you would be you. He loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you so that you could spend eternity with him forever in heaven and have a free, full life here on earth. So humility isn't saying, I'm no good, I'm not important, nobody loves me, having an Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh kind of lifestyle. No, it's just saying, I'm not God. We realize that we're not God. 
Proverbs 29, 23 says, pride ends in a fall while humility brings honor. Now, if you're out there and you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, I'm so glad he's talking about this because I don't struggle with pride. That's the tricky thing about pride. That actually is pride. So you have to be careful. Pride is the one thing that once you think you don't have it anymore, you get proud and then you have it again. So what we want to do is we want to constantly check our pride. And admitting that we're powerless reminds us that we can be humble. It actually puts us in a position of humility. Often we're tempted to look at the changes that we're making in our lives and say, look at what I did. I made that happen. I did that growth. I changed that. And there's no doubt you and I have some work that we do as part of our recovery journey. But all of it is filled and fueled by our higher power, Jesus Christ. Any changes that we really actually make come from God not from ourselves. And if we continue to remind ourselves of that, that is a pride killer in our lives. Because pride is a trap. The more pride we feel, the less we feel like we need God. But the more we realize we need God, the less proud we become. And so what we're looking for is the humility that says, God, you are God and I am not. I'm loved by you, I'm important because you've made me so, but I'm not you. And when I change, I give you, God, the glory. So the first thing we lose is our sense of pride. When we admit we're, we're powerless, the second thing that we lose is the O in our acrostic, and that stands for only ifs. I'm sure you've had this conversation in your life before. You've had the case of the only if that person hadn't walked out of my life. Only if I had stopped drinking earlier, I didn't get in the car that night, only if I had decided not to log on, or if I could only figure out how to stop eating so much or not enough, if I could only figure out my, pro my solution, I would like, my life would be better. And when we admit that we're powerless, we can change that and we can step into reality. Because that if only, only if kind of thinking is really just an escape. We have amazing minds and we can rationalize and justify anything. And although some of those can sound like uh, that I'm feeling bad about something, it can also help me go, well, if only I could figure this out, then I'll be okay. Or, or maybe I can just hide things or it leads to rationalization. Rationalization is that thing that you go, well, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but at least I haven't done this. Or yeah, maybe I look at inappropriate websites, but I'm not trolling. Or maybe I'm not doing, I'm spending money, but at least I'm not gambling. Or, and there's all this rationalization that happens. And the problem with rationalization is that it helps, it keeps things covered and it keeps things hidden. And when we live in that if only, only if kind of world, we keep hiding because we're ashamed. Because if you really think about it, those statements are statements of shame. And, and what we need to do instead is just say, this is what has happened. Either this is, these are the things I've done or these are the things that have been done to me. Some of them I re regret I've done. There's lots of things I wish weren't done to me, but this is what's happened and bring them out into the light. If you need to go back and watch last week's lesson on denial. This is exactly what we talked about, that exposing things to God's light is where we find healing. But when we try to keep rationalizing, we try to keep hiding, we hear in Luke 12, two through three, Whatever is covered up will be uncovered, and every secret will be, will be made known. So then whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in broad daylight. So it doesn't do us any good to just keep on pretending that things are okay, or to cover them up with rationalizations or justifications. Now, I know sometimes if you hear that verse from Luke, it's kind of scary thinking, oh, you're going to blast it everywhere. And that's not what we're saying at all. God knows our hearts, and he sees to the core of who we are. One of my favorite things to do is if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible, and you read about Jesus, he'll, people will be saying something or they'll be thinking something, and it'll say, Jesus knew their hearts. And I love that because Jesus knows us intimately. He knows the things we're trying to hide from him. And he's basically saying, just bring it out. Just talk to me about it. Rather than hiding it, let's shine the light on it. Let's deal with it so that you can live in freedom. So we lose our pride, we lose the only ifs. The third thing we lose is our worry. Now, I've admitted this before, and if you've heard me talk before, you know that I've said this. I, I'm a worrier. I'm really good at worrying. I'm an MVP of worrying. I'm better than you. 
at work. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. I'm really good at it. If you tell me something good that happened in your life, I can tell you three things that you should worry about. But I also am getting so much better at this. Before I was in recovery, I worried about everything all the time. And now I've learned some antidotes to worry. And one of the things that keeps us from worrying is admitting that we're powerless. Why? Because worrying, in effect, is us trying to, again, play God's part. If you think about when you worry, when I worry, I say things like, hey, Johnny, how are you going to get out of this one? Oh, man, what are you going to do? you got to do this thing. you got to pay this bill. you got to go to this place. you got to have this conversation. you got to hope this changes. What are you going to do? And in effect, what I'm doing is I'm praying to myself. And when we exchange worry for worship, we find amazing change in our life. When instead of having that conversations with ourselves, we bring God into the picture and we go, hey God, this is going on. I don't know how to handle it. What are you gonna do? I don't have the power that you have, God. Help me out in this. We don't have to worry anymore. And we begin to be able to trust God more because if we're honest, worrying is actually just a form of not trusting God enough. Now I have to tell you that when I first started recovery, if somebody would have said a statement like that to me, that would have hurt me deeply because I'm somebody who struggles with worry and anxiety and just being told, well, just trust God more. is hard because I feel like I do trust God. But I can tell you this, after years of recovery, after years of counseling and different things, that it's true. What I'm doing is I'm putting, again, myself in God's position when I'm worrying. And what I love is that the Bible tells us over and over again to not worry. Matthew 6, 34 says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. So I love that. It says, don't worry. And then later on in scripture, in the book of Philippians, there's this amazing verse. It's found in Philippians 4, 6. And it says this, don't worry about anything, but with in everything, with prayers and thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Here's what I love about that. It says, don't worry. But instead of just saying, don't worry, in it's chastising way, saying, don't worry, stop it. It says, don't worry. Instead, pray. Whenever you're freaking out, pray. Whenever you're worrying, pray. Anytime you start to have that running track in your head as you're worrying about what you're going to do next and what this world is coming to and, and how you're going to pay the bills and what's going to happen next and how you're going to get past this hurt, hang up and habit and how you're going to rebuild this relationship, stop and turn that worry into prayer. Talk to God about it instead. I'm not saying that all of your prayers are going to get answered on the spot and it's all going to feel better right away, but he will, because he says so in his word, he will exchange your worry with his peace. Keep praying about it. Keep bringing it to him. When you worry, stop. Remember Jesus saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Pray about it. Tell me what's going on. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and overburdened by life, and I will give you rest. Those burdens can weigh us down. He says, I want to take them off of you. So when we worry, it just, it weighs us down. It keeps us stuck. And when we pray, we can give those to God and really say, hey, this is yours anyway. I'll never forget years ago, we were, I was getting ready to go on one of our Celebrate Recovery One Day events. Before COVID happened, we used to do about 18 of these events throughout the year where we travel to different places and teach about how to do Celebrate Recovery. We can't wait to get back to do those things again. But I remember one morning, it was early in the morning, so I was trying to sneak my suitcase out of the house without waking everybody up. And I locked the front door. And as I did, I said, okay, God, you're in charge. And I started to walk to my car and I really started laughing because I thought like the rest of the time he's not Johnny, like the rest of the time I'm here, God. So you take it easy. I'll take care of everybody. I'll make sure everything happens well. But once I leave, you're the man of the house. When the reality is he's in charge all the time. And what we're doing when we're praying to him is we're reminding ourselves, hey, you're in control. You've got this. There are things I don't like, but you're in control and you're going to use this for your glory. So when we step out of our power, when we, try to, when we stop trying to do things on our own, we get to lose our worry because we're not responsible for it anymore. The next thing that happens when we admit we're powerless is that we lose the need to escape. That's the E and R acrostic, escape. You've heard that term fight or flight in our lives. The escape is that 
flight part, right? Where we say, this is too much, I want out. This is where we go, we use, we drink too much, or we use drugs, or we go look at something online, we spend money, we eat food, we do the thing that releases the tension and provides for us a temporary escape. And this escape feels like what we're after, and it feels like it's what prote what's protecting us, but if you have any experience with this, you know that you need the next escape and the next escape and the next escape sooner and sooner and you need more and more of that thing to provide you with that escape and sooner or later that's not enough so you have to up the ante and it gets worse and harder and tougher to back away from. When we admit that we're powerless over our own, our own issues, we don't need to escape anymore because we're able to live in freedom and live in truth that God is going to help us. That it's not about jumping to the ne that next unhealthy relationship. God's in control. It's not about going to drink or drug or to use or to act out, to judge other people, control someone else, whatever your issue is. Instead, God says, you don't need to escape. I'm here. My power is enough. We're going to take care of this. You don't have to run away from this. Ephesians 5, 13 through 14 says, for the light is capable of showing everything for what it really is. It's possible for the light, the thing, for the light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. What that saying is, is that when the thing that we feel like we need to escape, the problem is under God's light, all of a sudden we go, hey, that's not as scary as I thought it was. I don't know, maybe when you were a kid or if you have kids, you've had that, that moment where the blood curdling scream comes from their room and it's, mommy, mommy, there's a monster in my room. And you turn the light on and it's a coat or it's a, a towel folded over a chair. When we turn the lights on, the thing that we were so afraid of, we go, oh, that wasn't scary. That was just a random object. And when God shines his light on our problems, we see I don't actually need to escape because I'm not alone here. This is a problem that he and I can overcome together. So we, we lose that need to keep escaping. The R, the next thing we lose is resentments. So we lose our pride, we lose our only is, we lose our, er, our, our worry, we lose the need to escape, and then we lose our resentments. And this one is a big one. In fact, this is part of the, maybe one of the biggest parts of recovery for all of us, no matter what issue you're struggling with. So many of us are bound up so tight by carrying resentments against other people. People who did something wrong to us, who hurt us. And we walk around reminding ourselves of what they've done. But resentments act like a cancer. They hurt us, but they actually don't do anything for that other person. In recovery, we learn how to let go of those resentments. Now, that's not a tonight thing if you're brand new. That's not something that you're going to watch a video, go to a CRC or online open share group, and you're going to go, oh, I don't, I don't have these resentments anymore. This is going to be a day-by-day, step-by-step process. And in fact, there are still people who've hurt me in my past that I have to remind myself over and over again that I've forgiven them. And I'm working through those resentments. But we're able to give those up because we're no longer trying to hold on to our power. See, when we hold on to resentments, what we're doing is we're saying, God, this person's hurt me and I can't let them off the hook because I'm in control and I'm going to be the one who punishes them for what they've done. I'm going to be the one that holds them responsible for what they've done. And God says, hey, let go of that. Let go of that. Stop holding on to that. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anger is a God-given emotion. If, we, if you read the scriptures, you'll see Jesus getting angry. But what we do with our anger can become a sin. And by allowing the sun to go down, meaning we don't forgive, we hold on to that, and we, we just keep holding on and allowing that resentment to grow and fester in our lives, it actually hurts us. And it keeps us from finding the health and the freedom and the joy that we're looking for. For you and I to find that, we actually do have to move past those resentments. We have to forgive people. But like I said, this is a process. So maybe as you're watching this video, you're thinking, man, there's somebody who hurt me that I could never forgive. What I would say is maybe tonight or while you're watching, all you do is you just say, Hey, God, I'm willing. In fact, I'm willing to be willing to forgive them. Help me out in this way. And then watch what he does as you walk down the road to recovery. The L in our acrostic, the next thing we lose is our loneliness. We talked about this last week, how denial alienates us from God and isolates us from other people. And 
our powerlessness actually creates or our power when we try to be in control it actually creates a sense of loneliness in our lives hebrews 13 1 through 2 says continue to love each other with true brotherly love don't forget to be kind to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it imagine that we talk a lot about recovery about serving other people and in fact if you stay around long enough and celebrate recovery you yourself are going to have to make a decision are you going to hold it to yourself or are you going to help other people and give it away i'll tell you this if you want recovery to last if you want that freedom to last the key is to give it away to serve other people and that's one of the things that helps us break away from this loneliness we see we're not alone anymore i don't know how many people are watching live right now but i do know this every one of them has at some point thought like i have thought about myself no one can understand me you might be watching that you might be watching right now and thinking that very thing that very thing you might be thinking man johnny if you knew what I'd done, if you knew where I'd been, if you knew the things I said or the actions I took, or maybe even if you knew what happened to me, you wouldn't want anything to do with me. And I say to you, try me. I know that I felt that way when I first started attending Celebrate Recovery. Heck, I'm the founder's son. Pastor John and Cheryl Baker are my parents. And in December of 1999, I called them from Orange County Jail because I had just gotten arrested for a DUI. You think I didn't think that if I showed up, I was going to be judged, I was going to hurt my parents by me showing up, that people were going to go, man, look at this loser. His parents started this program and look what he's done. I had all those thoughts and more running through my mind the first time I attended Celebrate Recovery for my alcoholism issues. So I know what it's like. But that fear will keep you at an arm's distance from other people. When instead, if you go to CelebrateRecovery.com and you look for a CR in your area, and you join a CRC or online step study. By the way, that stands for Celebrate Recovery Crisis Response uh, Online Open Share Group or Step Study. Or if there's a church who's open and meeting in your area, you can go there. You'll find other people who have felt that same way and they wanna let you know that you're welcome. They wanna let you know that they're gonna accept you. They're, they're, they're not gonna turn you away. They're gonna welcome you in and they're gonna help you as you begin this recovery journey. Reach out reach out and watch what God does as he shatters that loneliness. So many people in my life, my closest friends are all people from recovery because we're all people who know that we're broken, that we've made mistakes and God is responsible for the change he's made in our lives. And just that level of honesty and, and just being able to be on the same page allows relationships to go so much deeper. I don't want to take too much more time because I know I'm running a little bit long, but this is a long acrostic. Give me a break. The E in our acrostic, the next thing we lose is emptiness. Hey, do you have that feeling? Do you ever have that sense of emptiness? Where you just walk around and you feel like, man, who cares? What? What's the point? Who cares? Now, why, we, why try it all? That's that feeling of emptiness when we're trying to do things on our own power, it's because we're isolated from a relationship with God. And God gives us purpose. God gives meaning to our lives. And, and working through the recovery process allows us to see what he wants to do. There's a verse in the Bible, John 10, 10. It's one of the most famous verses of all. And Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he comes to give life and life in all its fullness. I used to misread that verse. I thought that meant that when I died, I'd go to heaven and then that full life would be available to, available to me. But what Jesus is actually saying is, I came so that right now, Johnny, you can have a full life. And he's saying the same thing to you. I came that you could have a full life, full of purpose, full of meaning, full of, of change and freedom, where you could not, you would no longer be bound by those things that keep you stuck. You'd no longer be bound by those things you can't move past, but instead you'd have a free, full life he will fill that emptiness inside of you because he loves you and he's got the power to do it got two letters left the first s in powerless the first s that we lose is selfishness like pride from time to time we all struggle with selfishness if if i think you're kidding yourself if 
you don't think every once in a while, man, I'm the main character in this movie, right? Like if you go to the bank, the cameras are on you because you're the main character. Your friends, they're kind of the extras in the movie, but we're, I'm the star of this show, right? And I think that selfishness is something that even those of us who can be pretty selfless most of the time, selfishness, when we're trying to hold on, when we're trying to do things on our own, can rear its ugly head and we can start doing things out of selfishness to protect ourselves instead of allowing God to do things where we know he's going to change our lives. But to be honest with you, selfishness and pride are often at the heart, the core of all of our issues. Again, no matter why you're attending Celebrate Recovery, often if we're honest, when the lights are off and no one's around, most of us would say, yeah, I struggle with selfishness or I struggle with pride. I'm going to throw a third one. I struggle with anxiety or worry. When we turn those things over to God, he replaces them though. Our selfishness turns into selflessness. Jesus said this in Luke 17, 33, whoever clings to his life shall lose it. Whoever loses his life shall save it. Again, that's what we mean by giving it away. When I serve other people, God gives me a new purpose to my life. And he says, look, your life is better now. And trying so hard to hold on to yourself at the center of the story was going to choke the life out of you. But instead, you have all this room to breathe now because you're sharing with everyone else. And we lose that selfishness. The last S that we lose, the last thing that we lose when we admit that we're powerless is our separation. And again, this is our separation from God. Loneliness is what we feel when we don't have people in our lives. But separation is what we feel when we don't have God in our lives. Maybe you feel like God's far away. Maybe you feel like he's an impersonal God. One of my favorite names that God uses for himself over and over in the Bible is Father. Because God wants, to, wants us to see him as our daddy, as our father. The problem is, is that many have a, a hard relationship with their earthly father. And as a result, they have a hard time seeing God as father being anything loving or anything other than a judgmental, harsh, maybe abusive dad. But God says, no, I'm the perfect father. I can do things for you and want to do things for you in a way that brings you close to me. God says, I want to love you with this love that nothing can separate us from. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says this, for I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his, from God's love. Death can't and life can't. The angels won't and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he died for us. The power to change comes from God's grace. In the next coming weeks, we're going to talk more and more about this. You know, last week on the denial lesson, somebody commented, I was in this with you until you started talking about God. I got to be honest with you. This whole program is focused on, it's centered on Jesus Christ. He is our one true higher power. He is the one who saves us from death. He is the one who saves us from sin. He is the one who provides a new life for us, a full life for us. And he is the one who provides a, the possibility to have a relationship with God, to no longer live in separation, but to live in a relationship with him forever. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that. I, I hope that as you are doing this process along with us. You're not just watching these videos on your own and, and just kind of calling it good. I, that's great if you're watching these, but I want to encourage you to take the next step. I want to encourage you to go to CelebrateRecovery.com and click on Find a Group. Search for a group in your area. You can, you can search by your zip code or you can search by your town and, and a different radius of places that are near you to find a Celebrate Recovery in your area. Reach out to the people who are listed on that site and see if they're doing in-person Celebrate Recovery, depending on the county and the state that might be happening. If not, ask them if they're doing Celebrate Recovery crisis resp response groups online and join one. Start that process of sharing with other people and stepping out of denial, admitting that you are powerless and exchanging that for God's power. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us and then Jenny's going to come up and we're going to close with the serenity prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. Thank you for everyone who's watching, no matter when they're watching. Thank you for this technology. 
that allows us to meet together in a virtual large group in a way that we haven't been able to for months. And God, I pray that for everyone watching who's feeling powerless over their addictions and compulsive behaviors, that you would remind them that that is a good thing, that they can, train, they can exchange their powerlessness for your power, and their lives can be forever different. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, Jenny, why don't we read the serenity prayer together, and then we will close. All right, awesome. So this is the prayer for serenity. God, God grant, grant me the serenity. serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you haven't already, if you would share this so other people on Facebook could see it and you'd let them know that it's happening. If you have friends who aren't on Facebook, we are posting these videos on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to point people to that, that'd be great. And uh, you got anything else to say before we go? All right, bye everybody. See ya.